<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. The subject of reality, of how much we can know about the world and the terms upon which we engage with it, has occupied philosophers for millennia. However, recent advances in cognitive science, as well as radical new ways of interacting with the world and each other through digital technology, have not only opened up new unsettling avenues in the discussion of what is real, but also rendered an understanding of it significantly more urgent. What constitutes reality is no longer a concern simply for philosophers, if it ever was, but now weighs upon us, as e us every time we read the news or take a photo or check our social media. As Lawrence Scott writes in Picnic, Comma, Lightning, In Search of a New Reality, in the last few years we have become primed to ask ourselves, is this real or not? Picnic, Comma, Lightning acts in many ways as a guidebook to this new, unfamiliar landscape. Drawing inspiration from a deep well, Lawrence Scott deftly interweaves personal memories and experiences with philosophical theories, scientific research and pop culture. His nimble mind is as comfortable citing Virginia Woolf as Winnie the Pooh, as happy calling Aristotle or Baudrillard into service as evoking episodes of Friends, Dallas and Australian soap opera Home and Away. All of which makes for a highly readable, intellectually rigorous, brilliantly entertaining assessment of where our understanding of reality has reached and what is currently at stake for the future. Lawrence Scott's book, The Four-Dimensional Human, Ways of Being in the Digital World, was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize, won the Royal Society of Literature Jerwood Prize, and was named the Sunday Times Thought Book of the Year. His writing has appeared in The New Yorker, Guardian, Financial Times, New Statesman, Boston Globe, Wired and the London Review of Books. In 2011, he was named a New Generation Thinker by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and the BBC, and now regularly writes and presents documentaries for BBC Radio, as well as presenting and contributing to the Radio 3 Arts and Ideas programme, Free Thinking. He's a lecturer in writing at New York University in London, where he lives. The Sunday Times described Picnic, Comma, Lightning as a report from the front line of, his, of the digital generation by someone superbly well-equipped to read and decode the signals, while the TLS declared that, in an era of anti-nuance, his meticulousness is a tonic. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Scott to Shakespeare and Company. Thank you. Should I take this off or are um, we okay like Whatever that? you're most comfortable I'm, I'm happy with this. <laughs> it's lovely to see everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I guess we should begin at the beginning or indeed begin with the, the, the cover page because mm. I think one of the things that first strikes people when they, they see your book on the shelf, certainly I've seen this with our browsers, is the title and mm. the, the curious nature of the title. Mm. And some people are familiar with it, some people aren't. And of course it sort of weaves in with um, so much of your life experience and so much of what the book is about. Yeah. So would you be able to just unveil to people who aren't familiar <laughs> mm -hmm. where the title Picnic, Comma, Lightning comes from? Yeah, well, the title for the book came f in my life. I'd just um, been in town having lunch in London, and I had a tuna fish sandwich, and it was excellent. And I thought, what am I going to call this book? And I was walking up Upper Street, and I'd been reading Nabokov's um, uh, memoir, Speak Memory. And I thought, what am I going to call this book? Just at the proposal phase, and I just, uh, the, the line, uh, picnic, comma, lightning, came to me. I saw it sort of in my head, and I thought, the, the, my agent's not going to go for this, the publishers aren't going to go for this, it's too weird. Um, but what it's referring to, uh, for those who don't know, it's a line very early on in Lolita, uh, in which uh, Humbert Humbert is describing um, the death of his mother when he was three years old, and he said, my very photogenic mother died when I was three, and then he just opens brackets and writes, picnic, comma, lightning, close brackets. And that's all he, that's all we get. <laughs> That's all he mentions. And I remember reading Lolita and thinking, that is just so astoundingly bleak and funny and, <laughs> and um, brutal. Mm -hmm. um, and the, but then the more I was working on uh, sort of explaining, because of course you have to explain the title of this book, so in the introduction <laughs> I quickly get that out of the way to sort of relax the readers who don't know about it. But um, I, was, I was looking at the passage again, and to me it didn't strike me as, as brutal as I first thought it mm -hmm was and to me it was a little um almost like what else do you say about it you know it was the limits of language when something sublime like that that happens how do you he you know he was such a verbose ornate narrator who could describe uh, you know a pencil set for three paragraphs but his mother's death is getting um a little sort of parenthesis and i thought that was really apposite and appropriate in a way to the way the sublime way in which such personal deaths can't really be captured in words. And indeed, personal deaths uh, <clears throat> is something which defines this book as well, because yeah. you open by telling us that when you were in your th early 30s, mm -hmm. both of your parents passed away, and what you say was in impolite succession. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that might seem uh, to people an, an odd way to begin a book which is about, which is 
a lot about digital technology, a lot about yeah. the way we perceive the world. But in fact, being confronted with the, the death of your parents, and I think particularly mm -hmm. the death of both your parents, mm -hmm. you say sort of skewed mm -hmm. your understanding of reality and the way you interacted with the world. Yeah, I thought when I was thinking about this book, it was sort of a follow on in some ways to the four dimensional human, which was trying to think about how what digital life feels like and to try and find new images for it and, and mapping out that emotional landscape. So I knew I had more to say on that front, but I hadn't mentioned really um, those twin deaths in that book. And I thought, but I kept having this sense of urgency to want to write about them. And to me, there seemed a sort of poetic connection that, I mean, bereavement, uh, loss of parents particularly, is, is nothing unique to me. But it, um, it seemed to me that that kind of death um, renders more obvious and more vivid what a real person is, mm -hmm. what it means to live in time, what it means to remember things, what it means for people to be absent and present almost at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I thought there was a nice poetry between exploring sort of that idea of bereavement in relation to just the strange hauntedness and uh, perhaps gothic quality of digital life. Mm -hmm. And also just the way I suppose that you're the dynamic of your world changes, the sort of, mm. I, I suppose, when parents are still around, there's always a sense of hierarchy, a sense of authority, a sense of your your position, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, at least relative to, to, to these two people. Yeah. And, and as soon as that's taken away, and perhaps because it was in such quick succession, yeah. again, that must have been incredibly destabilizing. Yeah, and I think also it came at just about the time, it was uh, 2010 and 2012 so it was really when web 2.0 was really getting going and social media was really entrenching itself as a as a huge uh, phenomenon of daily life and i think that was an odd clash for me because it's mm. such a confessional mm. mode and there were so many things i didn't want to confess or if i did i would you know it would just be really shocking so i was at this weird disjunct between mm -hmm. um how i was being invited every day to respond to the world mm -hmm. but having this aspect of my life which had sort of no place in it as far as I was concerned, but I was interested in ways in which um, other people were mourning loved mm -hmm. ones online. And I was often either sort of, I thought, wow, that's so brave or horrified by the glibness of it. There was, I just didn't know how to feel about it. So mm -hmm. I felt for some reason that um, the digital revolution and just uh, us having to accept various grievances in life mm -hmm. had a strong resonance. It's interesting that you talk about this disjunct from a personal level, because I think from an external level as a reader, mm -hmm. there's a quite a potent rhyme, actually, between sort of you as narrator uh, having this kind of shift in your reality mm -hmm. and the skewing of your mm -hmm. reality. Mm -hmm. And as you say, in this time around the beginning of Web 2.0, yeah. There was so much in our in our world that was suddenly skewed <laughs> yeah. the way we interacted yeah. with each other. So, to the reader, it seems I think less of a disjunct than maybe it does uh, yeah. to you when you were experiencing it. Yeah, and also I think that's why it was uh, because when I think when you lose a parent in sort of your early thirties, you begin your childhood takes on a completely. Mm -hmm different cast in a different light then you want to sort of dwell on it because that's when they were there that's when they were mm -hmm. forming and there's sort of an urgency to recuperating that past um that maybe if they'd been living wouldn't quite have that edge but that seemed a really lost world mm -hmm. for someone born in 1980 it was very suddenly different that, that our relationship to the past and i teach students uh who are you know 18 19 mm -hmm. and so they don't have that analog childhood mm -hmm. so i wanted to sort of record some of the textures and rhythms mm -hmm. of that and that suited well with the remembrance of, mm -hmm. of my parents as well and yet uh, there's a moment you write um reality has never been all it's cracked up to be mm -hmm. um so this this idea of questioning reality of mm -hmm. having our sense of reality um put into doubt mm -hmm. is not unique to to our particular yeah, era yeah i mean there's there's a sort of rich history as i said in the introduction in philosophy of mm -hmm. uh, of people questioning what exactly reality is particularly in the 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 branch of uh, phenomenology mm -hmm. where it's sort of like how how can we know what this sort of this sense data we're receiving yeah. how it actually relates yeah. um, to the external world but what is there what is it for you about these last mm -hmm. say 10 or 15 years mm -hmm. i mean is there a qualitative difference a mm -hmm. quantitative difference between but between that and what's what's come before yeah i think yeah that was a really uh, tricky aspect of the book and the subtitle for the book gave sort of everyone real trouble so it's in search of a new reality but originally they wanted it to be how we lost touch mm -hmm. with reality and i thought you cannot 
I said to the publisher, I said, you can't put that on. That just leaves me a sitting duck <laughs> up here, you know, defending um, the book. How we, Some people would say, well, I haven't lost touch with reality. Uh-huh. Or um, they'd say, have we ever known reality at all? And so, yeah, in the introduction, I was thinking about, um, you know, going back to Plato. But even, you know, Nietzsche has a field day sort of saying, you know, uh, we always think there's this other world that we can't quite have access to, that this reality is never real enough. And he said, that's all we have. We have the surfaces of things, as you were saying, the appearance of things, how our sense states, uh, our sort of sensory stimulus hits our senses. Um, I think now there is a very clear uh, ways in which we're losing um, our grip on reality in this time. And almost you can stamp every era I believe, with the particular way in which the world feels unreal to them. Um, And in this sort of digital era, I really think that it's the collapse of the public reality and the private reality Mm. that is discombobulating all of us. So the way in which sort of our lives are turned inside out, we're invited all the time to share sort of the minutiae of our lives with unknowable Mm. audiences, the scale of which we can't even predict. Mm -hmm. So I think... um, the argument that I was trying to build to uh, towards the end of the book was that we're still trying to figure out how big we are, the size mm-hmm. of our real selves mm-hmm. in this new reality. It, to me, it seems a question of scale. So um, how do we speak in a small private voice, which is really meant maybe for four people who mm-hmm. would, we might say something curt or judgmental that might mm-hmm. be meant for a very select audience who would know the bounds of your malice. They would know some of your virtues as well. They would know what you meant by that. They would know the level of how ironic you were being. Um, and yet we might publish such a thing on social media and then the audience for mm. that, if it gets retweeted or whatever, could be unbounded. Mm. So, it, so even our private language is being... We're not quite sure how how largely we manifest in the world. And I have an image which really sort of sticks with me, which we can't tell if something that we write online is just a private opinion or one of the Ten Commandments, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and even the, the, the nature of our real feelings, how do we have a real feeling in a sort of overexposed digital public sphere, mm. which isn't in some way tactless. Mm. Or there's an example that always sticks with me, which is someone in London said, hooray, it's snowing in London, it's mm. quite a rare event. And um, and then she had she said that on Twitter, and lots of people were replying, say, think of the homeless, you know, this is going to be terrible <laughs> for them. Um, and to some, you know, and I say that, you know, we should be thinking of mm. the homeless, and we need to, you know, all the political citizenship reasons for that. But how do you have that sort of moment of seemingly innocent joy Mm. and maybe actually you know that kind of tact that this strange scale of social life demands will actually force Mm. political change a lot quicker just because we're finding we can't utter things or Mm. have feelings in quite the same way if we Mm. want to share them in that way there's so much to unpack in what you just said and i think we'll we'll come to it sort of Mm. progressively over the next half hour but i'd like to just return to uh, what you said near the beginning about this sort of this person who who says to you, I haven't lost touch with reality. Yeah. And there's a moment where you actually pose the question, you say, what does it mean to cast doubt on our grasp of reality yeah. when there are people with no clean water to drink or, well, well the bombs fall? Yeah. Yeah. And that is a yeah. fascinating question. Like, is there a... Uh, how? Why is this... Is, is this what, you know, might be called online sort mm-hmm. of first world problems? Is this something mm-hmm. which broadly is something we have the luxury to be concerned it, about? Or do you think it, it runs deeper than that totally i mean i think to one extent um yeah the bombs falling versus i'm in trouble on twitter totally different scales um <laughs> but on the other hand um there's i think it has important this sort of way in which reality is being reshaped and the way in which the private and the public realities are being blurred has real political implications mm-hmm. so we're seeing this um in the political, you know, in the landscape of America at the moment, sort of a president who's sort of uh, tweeting at 11 um, at night, just Mm. sort of his off-the-cuff thoughts, and this sort of collapse of the political stage whereby... um, Baudrillard, and I write about this, Baudrillard has a nice line where he says, in order for a political statement to mean anything, there has to be a stage on which... To, to utter it from, mm. to, you know, to speak from. And that's how our politics has always gone. Now, maybe we're in, in, the, in a phase where a whole new brand of politics is emerging. But uh, before this, it's been very important that we had a, a, an ability for political figures to speak political mm. sentences. But if, if their private lives and their 
you know, their personal peccadilloes are constantly being set alongside in parallel mm -hmm. to their political life. We have a moment where we're very destabilized in what we can believe in or what can be said even in the political stage. Mm. So although some of the the concerns might seem small in the in the scale of things, I think there's they, it, this is sort of a new way in which we're gathering and we're expressing ourselves and conducting ourselves. And I think politically that mm -hmm. has ramifications. This, this new way, is that in some way connected to um, this concept of stories and mm -hmm. narrative, mm -hmm. which you begin the book by talking mm -hmm. about at some length, this idea that um, it seems that recently in the last sort of uh, 10, 15 years, we've started not just looking, thinking of stories as a way in which we describe reality, mm -hmm. but actually being the reality itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Stories are a really tricky one. I don't know if you've noticed this, but they're sort of they're a unit of sort of how we move about the world. You know, every, especially in the UK anyway, you know, we're always being courted by online businesses to tell us our stories. You know, you just want to order a pizza. You have to <laughs> be friends with them on Facebook and then tell them your stories. <laughs> um, and it's... And, and um, or join the conversation or things like that. The story as sort of this unit um, as a way of sort of generating um, traffic and, mm -hmm. and is really sort of something that's happened in the last few years. And even all the major sort of social networking platforms have all used the word stories um, as a sort of an ephemeral short sort of thing that you can put mm -hmm. online that will come and go. Um, but it's called stories, even though most of them don't have any resemblance mm -hmm. to sort of the you know narrative form i keep clicking on friends stories and i <laughs> really don't see the story <laughs> element of them um oftentimes um, and i'm sure people are finding really cool ways to you know to tell narratives online but generally it's a funny term to give to it and and someone a tech insider said you know that stories is really the future of social media um and i was interested in the idea of the story and how we shape reality because it's sort of a uh, there's sort of a joke built into the word of it you know it's um on the one hand, it seems the truth, you know, tell me the story. What's the story mm. here? And on the other hand, it's a fictional form. Mm. So even there's this sort of double-sidedness to the story. And I think um, modern personhood and subjectivity has been encouraged. I sort of blame Oprah for this, but it could be totally <laughs> unfair. Maybe she might sue me so we could cut this out of the filming. <laughs> I don't know how litigious Oprah is. But um, she, she sort of encouraged people, I think, in the 90s, I was living in Canada at the time, to think of yourself as the hero of your own story and that you're in charge of your narrative. Sex and the City also uh, did that somewhat, <laughs> that you're writing your own story. And this seemed like a liberating thing for many people. And it, and it does have uh, liberating properties but a story is a very confining mm. way of shaping reality because it always excludes as much as it illuminates that's the necessity of it it's always a spotlight it can a story is always a, as much about excision as inclusion so it seems a funny form and technology to think about our lives and you know um, a lot of people there's sort of a fight over Freud's um, sort of a relationship to stories between uh, these two sort of Freudian experts and one of them is thinking that Freud believed that the story was uh, uh, building your life as a story was liberating and another uh, the journalist Janet Malcolm argued that you know this Freud believed that the story was an imprisoning thing mm -hmm. that to be trapped in your own story and actually part of the Freudian sort of process was to liberate you from these stories that you couldn't mm -hmm. almost get out from under um, so I'm interested in this sort of commercial uh, repetition of stories as this positive thing and this way of taking back control, but also of it being sort of a cage. And if we look at the, um, the sort of some of the big dramas that have come out recently, uh, The Handmaid's Tale uh, and Westworld, which mm. I don't know if many of you have seen Westworld about sort of the robots. Have you seen Westworld? It's very good. It's all about sort of um, very advanced um, AI sort of uh, creatures who are indistinguishable from humans who you sort of visit in this Jurassic Park style theme park but they're caught in the loops of narrative that their uh, designer has made for them and there's a real sort of obvious human mm -hmm. allegory but a lot and in The Handmaid's Tale as well um, Offred is often saying you know I wish I could be writing another story but this is the story I'm in and if and, you know in the, in the Handmaid's Tale um, to literally not spoil anything sort of ends on a sort of a <laughs> narrative in which it's sort of the sto the the ending is ambiguous, or mm -hmm. you're not sure how the story is ending. So I was interested in this idea of um, being asked to think of our realities as a story and how 
they, that seems quite a double-edged mm. thing. And you say our realities, because that's the, mm. the the fascinating thing as well. With, as soon as you start talking about stories, yeah, um, and it's sort of there's as you say on one side it feels liberating because it allows for a diversity of stories. Mm-hmm. It feels like it's going to sort of it's it's welcoming because it's going to allow more people to express yeah. reality in different yeah. ways. Yeah, but it also seems to undermine the idea of mm. a shared reality. Right. Yeah. Ha- yeah. yeah. No, I think there is that tension, and I think there's real um, progress that can come from um, the plethora of stories that are available and, and people who were unable to tell their stories being able to tell it. Mm-hmm. But we do have that problem of what's the shared reality mm-hmm. if, if, if sort of social life is produced by um, a multiplicity of stories, and maybe mm-hmm. it'll change how we even our ability to generalize you know the the nightmare of totalitarianism t- totalitarianism is one story mm-hmm. and that's sort of again going back to the outward that's gilead they live under a single narrative and that's the nature of the oppression um but there's this lovely moment in um thomas more's utopia which really blew me away i discovered it by accident but um af- you know the utopians have this lovely sort of relatively um, peaceful, agrarian, nice life. But the main achievement, I think, that the utopian that Thomas More imagined for the utopians was that um, they couldn't understand um, abstractions when it came to people. So you couldn't, they wouldn't, if you talked to someone who wasn't there and said they're generally like this or um, humans are like this in general, mm-hmm. it just wouldn't mean anything to them. Mm. Um, and I thought that is that is really utopia, uh, where you don't have the ability to tell this sort of monolithic but mythic idea of of a people. Mm-hmm. Um, it just it, it was sort of it sort of blew their minds. Mm-hmm. It just didn't they just didn't register it. And I thought that was that's probably a version of the multiplicity of stories where mm-hmm. you can't create an abstracted generalization of people mm. because there's too many stories undermining mm. it all the time. And a- another way of sort of stories b- being unifying rather than divisive as well you talk about um a a speech that tony morrison Mm -hmm. gave and it's probably a little long for us Mm -hmm. to go into tonight and also it's a further encouragement for people to buy the book and discover exactly um what you're Mm -hmm. talking about but that you know unsurprisingly tony morrison seems to be able to to strike this balance where stories can be diverse but also (laughs) unifying yeah i mean i could have filled the whole book talking about tony morrison really (laughs) really my main um interest was in tony morrison but the editor kept saying we've had enough tony morrison (laughs) quotations now um you need to move on from this um but really yeah if it could have been all tony morrison Mm -hmm. it would have been um but yeah she she's interested in that way in which language is both uh communally uplifting and uh, liberating mm-hmm. and yeah the, the I won't go into it but the scene in, that I mention in the book is based on her Nobel Prize acceptance speech where she's talking about uh, language as being able to um, open doors as as much as it can sort of mm-hmm. hem people in and you can get that online the speech mm-hmm. as well for free so so let's talk mm-hmm. um, a little bit about something else which I guess comes from from stories from myths it's, it's the concept of the um, the charmed object mm-hmm. um, and this sort of the uh, I, guess, I guess it's familiar to to a lot of people the idea of the power that objects can have and the yeah. sort of the the um, yeah the power we project onto them. Yeah. But one of the things um, which is very interesting about the time that we're living in now mm. is that it's possible in a very real sense to imbue objects with um, a sense of consciousness mm-hmm, or a, mm-hmm. or this kind of something which would have been considered magic or, yeah. or sorcery yeah um several several years before through this this idea of the internet of things yeah yeah there's um a mid-century novelist i love called elizabeth bowen um and she all her novels are littered with people having very sort of specific relationships to the furniture in their houses she was came from sort of this long anglo-irish line of sort of the big house in ireland and um sort of that in that colonial inheritance so she loved furniture she loved tables and chairs more than anything um and she has a character in one of her books think about i think it was a maid who was sort of um polishing a a, a table and the maid said that had this fancy that every time i polish the table it knows something more Mm. um and 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 a lot of people yeah get a bit annoyed by that sort of 
a clap trap sometimes, you know. <laughs> um, but I love it. I'm sort of on board with that. But then it, it really struck me that actually that is true now, mm. that our, our, some of our sort of smart appliances do know something more about us every time we interact with them. Um, and that, that, you know, I mean, there's I've listened to a lot of... Um, interviews and talk to sort of coders who believe you know the future utopians for their utopia for them digitally is when there's this what they call an ecosystem of linkedin devices um and they're coming um <laughs> <laughs> i've said enough um <laughs> Um, yeah, where, you know, you can be watching TV and your TV's like, you've been watching TV for too long, mm. you know, and you have a, a Fitbit on and you're, you're getting too sluggish. So I'll send a message, the TV will send a message to the fridge. It'll say, order this person healthy food for a bit because they've been too sedentary. And all of this, I mean, it's a bit like having... Um, so a fleet of servants, and you're this sort of helpless aristocrat in a way. Um, but the yeah, this sort of sense that you're um, the things of the home, which again, going back to the public private sort of collapse, this sense that when you get in from the outside world, you lock the door and you have your stuff, and with all its memories mm. that, that you're projecting onto it, your associations. I'm really interested in the idea that the home will be this forevermore, this porous thing, where mm -hmm. at night where you've shut down your living room and the kitchen and click off the lights. There the, used to be, I think, that sense of sort of relief and release from public demands, mm -hmm. but that idea that your fridge is sending data out into the world and, and receiving data in, to me, that's a complete redesign of our uh, phenomenological relationship to mm -hmm. things in the home and the sense of the fortified home space which mm -hmm. just isn't the case and when, and when you when you write about it you evoke um sartre and this mm -hmm. uh his sense of nausea mm -hmm. with the sort of the the sort of the interconnectedness of of objects yeah that, yeah um and it, you talked about these these coders for example who see the situation you you described as mm -hmm. quite um as quite utopian mm -hmm. in fact it's sort of be you know that they they it uh relieves them of the need to to think about what they eat, or to, yeah, or yeah. you know, it, it keep, maybe keeps them keeps them healthier, and yeah. so will kind of encourage a, a normal life. And I'm just wondering, yeah. I, I could see kind of both sides. I mm -hmm. think there's a part of me which is drawn um, to this. I suppose the image of the the servants, which you <laughs> which yeah. you just evoked, is yeah. like actually, yeah, it would be it would be nice to to just have my fridge know what I need and yeah. to get that in, and that sort of will free up my time and free yeah. up my space for. Yeah. Um, for more, I don't know, more intellectual mm -hmm. pursuits or cultural pursuits. And yet, at the same time, I, I do also understand that sense of this kind of crowding mm -hmm. um, that can come with that. I mean, do, you, do you think there's that's something which, as we get more interconnected, and as, for example, you talked about your students, like, mm -hmm. um, as they are born more and more into that world, mm -hmm. do you think it's just something that we will overcome, that we will get get over or do you think it's something which is inherent to the experience of interacting with these kind of objects yeah it's, it's hard to tell isn't it whether it's paternalism or servitude it's a weird combination and maybe servants were always slightly mm. sort of, um, paternalistic in their own way i don't know um i can't tell um i think my i'm trying to think about what my students would think about that it would it would normalize pretty quickly i think mm -hmm. i would say for them that their fridge knew better than they did uh -huh. what should be uh, being eaten or not i mean um yeah the idea i think and we'll see it for sure of um the digital world coming closer and closer to the body so it's it might, now it might be the fridge but there's already you know earlier this year there was um is it Ra it was ralph loren i think who launched a, a sort of a brand of smart clothing so that it had bluetooth technology in it um, and so when you walk by a Ralph Lauren store, you got rewards. I love that word, <laughs> rewards. It's like stories. We have all these rewards. Um, and, and you become, you know, you become a little brand ambassador for them. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, there's a designer I talk about in the book who in 2014 said that wearables, not just sort of Fitbits, but in clothing, um, will be a future trend whereby um, there'll be biometric sensors that can mm -hmm. tell um, your sort of feelings based on your heart rate mm -hmm. or breathing or whatever and will know, depend on how peaked you are uh, physiologically, what sort of adverts you'll 
you know mm. respond to and he says you know i'll know how what relevant offer to send you on your mm-hmm. smartphone based on what your shirt is telling you so again it's not even the fridge that's this strange spy in the house it's these your garments are these turncoats mm. well that that's an interesting choice of words spy as well i yeah. think and i do wonder if that's one of the things which sort of undermines this utopian vision of of the of the d- digital culture is a yeah. particularly as we have grown into this world where we're used to not really paying for any of the services. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That ultimately the the thing that, that drives this economy is data and mm-hmm. that they can therefore use to market mm-hmm, things at mm-hmm, you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I often think when people talk about, um, oh, you know, it's a shame that Twitter has got so nasty mm-hmm. now. It does make me think, well, yeah, this is, but this is a network that was founded on... Again, this kind of this idea that we're going to collect your data, we're going to market things mm-hmm. at you. We're going to, like, is it sort of? Do you think it's sort mm-hmm. of inherent in that sort of capitalist mm-hmm. model in a way that if if you're you know that idea that if you don't pay, you're mm-hmm. the product that these things yeah. will ultimately be more spy than than servant. Definitely, yeah. In a word, yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, Facebook was invented to sort of judge sort of the the female sort of students in Mark Zuckerberg's dorms relative attractiveness. Mm. So I, mean, I don't know why we think these have sort of benign origins. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I think um, for sure, I think if we don't, if that's sort of the economic model we want to live with, um, I'm really interested along that line. I don't write about it so much in the book, but I hint at them towards the end. But the idea of the influencer mm-hmm. really captivates me. You know, the social media influencer who's amassed a large enough following that they can then name a product and get paid for Mm. sort of naming them so youtubers with lots of followings i just love the word influencer because it's so brazen it doesn't even hide (laughs) you know the idea that this is a manipulative sort of Mm. pastime it reminds me of of a batman villain you know like you have the riddler (laughs) the the penguin and the influencer is in town um and and when i looked up this uh i looked i noticed that shakespeare because you could this i mean digital life is great in many ways and one of them is that i could look up how many times shakespeare used the word influence mm-hmm. in his corpus or oeuvre and um yeah he used it 13 times mm-hmm. and i saw each one of them it's brilliant and um most of them were to do with sort of a, the malign influence of a star mm-hmm. or a heavenly body um and you know they're under some influence and so this idea of um sort of uh, an economic model in which there's maybe a stable middle class sort of, you know, grasping, sort of clinging to the middle class by being these sort of sort of part-time spokespeople for mm-hmm. products. I mean, it's pretty um, sci-fi dystopia. Mm-hmm. Sort of, and it's sort of, you don't even have to go, you know, it's already with us now. But, I mean, there's a, there's a really good, um, at least sort of um, the first episode is really good of a series on Netflix called Maniac. It stars Jonah Hill and Emma Stone. And that world that they um, showed in that was a very near future to ours of just the saturation of commercial life and everyday mm. life. So you, if you didn't have the money, you could pay for to have an ad buddy. You huh. you know, if you wanted a coffee, you'd be like, I'll pay for that with ad buddy, please. And ad buddy would entail s- having someone sitting next to you for the next 24 <laughs> hours selling you things, like sort of almost a <laughs> you know, death of a salesman type thing, saying, how about this, how about that? Shit, mm. uh, sh- uh, shadowing you everywhere. So I think, <laughs> I mean, the commercial, I think that'll be our big ethical battle is how we stop or how we limit the saturation of civic life Mm -hmm. in commercial um, agendas because Mm. it seems to me there's no digital common space there's no Mm. I can't think of a park like a municipal park Mm. version of that in Mm. cyberspace I mean I think that's happening actually more and more there's more social networks that are coming up that are more that aren't sort of um data driven and, and and how they pay for themselves mm. they might be subscription based and i think that'll be really essential to maintain the diversity of uh, of common space it's interesting though isn't it because that sense of common space when you think back to sort of the the early days of the internet that's yeah. exactly how it was sold to people I mean, yeah. it did have this very sort of utopian yeah idea to it yeah and yet it very quickly became yeah i, I suppose in, in a way it was sort of inevitable if it was going to sure. be a free space for sure then oh, who's oh, paying for it and how are you paying for it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, a guy called john perry barlow and i was told he died either this year or very recently who wrote 
this sort of in the 90s, 96 is manifesto for an independent cyberspace. And again, it's just this little tract and you mm. can get it online. It's so funny to read it, say, the, the 90s imagining <laughs> of what the internet would be. Um, and it would be a place without bodies and, you know, your government laws won't have any um, business here, will move freely. And it was, as you say, it was all about freedom. That, I mean, it's not surprising that it's mm-hmm. been... Um, co-opted in this way and mm-hmm. there's many benefits as well but um we have to keep an eye on i think sort of the psychological ramifications of living in a commerce space 24 mm-hmm. 7 did he uh, predict the proliferation of cat memes uh- <laughs> um yeah this is not where bodies live this is where cats will haunt you. <laughs> but that, that's one of the things that I mean, you talk about the influences and one of the ways that they uh, are most able to influence is through the visual image. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly um, among sort of many compelling chapters in the book. I think one of the most mm-hmm. compelling is when you talk about the, the, the effect that this proliferation of images mm-hmm. has not only on the way we interact with each other on this, uh, this question of, um, of, of how we see each other's lives, but also uh, the way we see our own lives, yeah. the way we form memories, yeah. the way even we... Um, we trust or lose trust in, mm-hmm. in the people around us. Yeah. There's this really lucky thing that sometimes when you're working, you get these sort of little charms thrown at you. And, and I've been thinking about 1984 and the surveillance society. And then I discovered that the first sort of Polaroid, it was called a land camera, um, was sort of um, produced in 1948. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a brilliant inversion. And why it was sort of invented was because the inventor's daughter, uh, sort of little daughter, wanted... Um, to see the picture more immediately. So mm. he thought, I, I can invent something where the Polaroid will come out and sort of satisfy mm. this sort of small child's craving to see the image instantly. And now, of course, mm. we all have that. And I think uh, people like to believe that, you know, especially if you write on digital life, you'll get a lot of people who might say to you, you know, if I read something from 1870, people felt that the world was getting faster, that mm. w- there was too much information, you know, that yeah. there's, it's always speeding up. And that there's this strange, they're arguing for this strange constancy, this sort of phenomenological constancy across yeah. time. And I just have to say, to, to a certain extent, that's true, that human nature has a limited palette of emotions and responses. But there's some quantifiably different mm-hmm. things. And one of them is our ability to be portable camera people, mm-hmm wherever we go now. So um, I think that's a massive change. And there's examples of it being amazing for social justice. So there was the famous case of the person who got pulled off the the aeroplane. I, can't, I never get the which airline it was. I'm not going to say it. But someone <laughs> um, was pulled off a flight for, because they were sitting in seats that were required. And it was really brutally done by the employees. And people were able to film that. And from that... You know, there was real sort of corporate responsibility in saying and boycotting, and so the, and there's amazing things that are being done with just saying this is what really happened. Um, but I think there's a cruel irony already emerging, which is in even in the in the final uh, weeks I was writing the book, there were stories about deep fakes mm-hmm. um, and the idea that uh, through AI and machine learning you could. Uh, recreate images or the voices of people to the extent that two lawyers in the New York Times wrote that it, it's not unlikely that soon um, such evidence will be inadmissible in court. Mm-hmm. And even Trump on his sort of damning Access Hollywood tape um, that where he was sort of, which came out right before the election, which didn't damn him um, as much as people expected. Um, he actually tried to argue afterwards that it wasn't his voice, mm-hmm. that it was sort of a deep fake thing, but he'd forgotten he'd already apologised for it. <laughs> so... Um, But it seems to me, in terms of, like, the image, like, we have this really sort of strange time where we have seem to have more evidence for the real. Like, I can, you know, you were really here, you were really here. There's a sense of documentation and a proliferation of evidence at the same time as the uh, origins and nature of that evidence is being Mm -hmm. undermined. And there's, you know, the whole Airbnb... Um, economy which sort of is called the trust economy. I wrote about this in my first book that the founder of Airbnb said um, uh, famously he's called Brian Chesky, he said We'd, we feel that you can't be trusted in a place where you're anonymous um, and I thought that was a really strange thing for someone who's sort of trying to get a trust economy going, <laughs> um, not a, a sort of a paranoid vision of mm. humanity um, and there's uh, after Facebook, there's this um, not, uh, after Airbnb, there was this really interesting business that I saw an ad for on the Tube in London, and it was for a dog walking service called Tailster. 
And they said in that, they said, with um, GPS tracking um, and video footage, our trusted dog walkers don't just tell you they've walked the dog, they show you. <laughs> um, I thought, what about them is trusted in this case? Uh, you know, because trust relies on an, uh, on an aspect of the unknown. Mm -hmm. You know, if everything can be uh, corroborated with evidence, then philosophically there's no need for trust mm -hmm. to exist in a society. So there's a strange tension between we can show you what happened and that data being sort of undermined. But also what will happen to those moments if that becomes the norm where an employee or whoever some, uh, so in the service industry has to provide digital sort of evidence in a portfolio of CCTV footage, what happens to those who don't do that? Mm -hmm. Will the undocumented past take on this quality that maybe would surround sort of smugglers and pirates sort of mm -hmm. or people on the outside of sort of so-called socialized society mm -hmm. who are doing maybe shady things well all of our stories if you don't have the receipts as mm -hmm. the young people say will they have this air of just well that didn't happen or mm -hmm. which which is what pushes people i guess towards this um it's not maybe not even a desire to sort of expose their their private life in public but also perhaps it almost feels like like a need like we talked a little yeah. bit already about this uh this uh overlapping i guess between the the public and the private and indeed you describe it as um arguably this era's most influential feature the yeah. fact that sort of this 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 boundary between between yeah. the public and the private is d y disintegrating yeah there's this um for me um the idea that chills me the most in the book and that I think about it the most is this idea of obscenity because it, um, in digital life with the proliferation of online pornography there's been a lot of talk this is an obscene era and um, when I in 2016 there was a judge in America or a governor in America who declared it sort of uh, pornography and uh, sort of a health hazard almost like a national emergency for the youth. And there are arguments to be talked about, like what is sort of this access to pornography doing to people? And obscenity is the legal term for that type of thing. Pornography isn't a legal thing, but something that is deemed obscene can be sort of censored and things like that. But it struck me that there was another way and maybe more fundamental way that these were obscene times. And it comes actually from the root of the word obscenity because etymologists can't decide fully where why where we get the word obscene from and the latin root is obscenum which is the sort of the idea of genitals or filth or uncleanness that we think of with the pornography example perhaps but there's also uh, the greek um, etymology which is obscene or obscene i think is the pronunciation which just means off stage or okay. behind the scenes and i feel like we're living in obscene times for that reason i feel that the backstage has become the center stage, mm -hmm. um, and, and especially in politics, but all sorts of life, like the private moments of life are being advertised or being sort of illuminated by us all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the ways in which um, life is obscene. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that may have certain um, possibilities for new ways, as I was saying, new ways of doing politics, for mm -hmm. instance, where all your politicians are obscene figures, where you can't hide behind sort of this hypocrisy. Um, but there's... For, just to give you an example of this, uh, of this the, this obscenity, during the election, George Clooney was um, drumming up uh, money for Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. He was doing a Hillary Clinton fundraiser, and it was like three hundred thousand dollars per plate. And afterwards, uh, and there were protesters at the demonstration saying there shouldn't be this much money in American politics. And because of the, the that legislature, Citizens United, where it, there's no regulation on how much money can be used, so he gave an interview afterwards, and he said. Um, you know what, I agree with you. You know, he went over and talked to the protesters who were protesting against it. He said, I can't wait um, till to get Hillary elected and uh, get the Democrats all up and down, you know, down ticket, all elected, so that I never have to do another um, Hillary Clinton fundraiser again and I can get this stupid, and he said the word obscene money mm -hmm. out of American politics. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, on the one on three nights before you have the suave George Clooney host of this Hillary Clinton fundraiser in his bow tie saying welcome everyone thank you for your three hundred thousand dollars and then in an interview three days later saying I hate Hillary Clinton fundraisers and this goes beyond hypocrisy this is saying I have my private opinion and my public persona and they, they they're not even hypocritically clashing they're just sitting alongside mm one another in parallel and that's a really jarring way in which we have to approach people with their public and their private attitudes 
running in parallel. And what was really funny in that, one of the protesters shouted at him and said, you sucked at Bat- as Batman. Um, <laughs> and that was a really brilliant thing for my, the purpose of my argument because, of course, Batman um, has to keep a very rigid... Um, sort of masked, fully masked <laughs> distinction between his public and private life. That's the whole point of Batman, that his Bruce Wayne uh, sort of millionaire shenanigans don't impede on his crime-fighting shenanigans. And maybe one of the ways he sucked at Batman was because George Clooney didn't know the difference between public and private life. And yeah, I get the sense that we we can... We kind of allow that difference now in a way that maybe even 10 years ago I don't think mm-hmm. we necessarily would. Like, there seems to be... A, a tolerance for for these two personas yeah and i just wonder what what sort of what provoked that is that do you think that's just sort of that's just habit we've just got used to people sort of balancing these mm-hmm. two things and presenting both of them to us that we've come to yeah. that's just the way we read the world now yeah it's the i think it's the form of social media mm. has actually produced this change uh, and i mentioned in the book about there's a a documentary for the store tiffany's in new york and you get you got katie couric who's a famous news anchor there um, giving this really sentimental, cheesy thing of like, when people move to New York, they come to follow their dreams and eventually their dreams lead them to Tiffany's. <laughs> and this is in the trailer. So she says that and then they cut and she goes, do I know how to give fucking good sound bites or what? And they and they put two next to each other <laughs> in the clip. And I'm like, actually, why does that behind the scenes appeal to us now? Um, and I think it gives us a charge of sort of... Um, the sense of being in on it or, mm. you know, a very human need to enjoy, to sort of see sort of the mechan- the working mechanisms of things. But it really sort of can, in certain circumstances, cast a cynicism mm. over public life. Not even, it was beyond irony, beyond hypocrisy, just sort of cynical and jadedness uh, in certain quarters. And um, on a much more lighthearted and less important note, I think, um, there's the habit of um, actors, sort of especially in the States, being encouraged to live tweet during their own performances and say that scene was really hard or congratulations to my (laughs) co-star and it's a way of getting live tv becoming an event again so that you get that bonus behind the scenes footage and we've always had you know dvd extras have told us how it was or whatever we've always loved that but to have it happening in real time um is a really strange thing where your actor is has their greek persona mask on on your screen and they're in the audience with you at the same time talking about it. So say what you like that. I don't think that's happened before in, in human history. It's also odd because it encourages a uh, disconnection of concentration from mm-hmm. the, the, the scene itself. Yeah, it, it, yeah, and no, we don't seem to mind that our, fa- our sort of in, in culture, our sort of fantasies, our suspension of disbelief are being sort of un- mm-hmm. are being popped mm-hmm. while they're being made. I don't know, it's a strange thing. But- I think I am very conscious there will be questions from the yeah. audience, um, and I've, uh, I, could, I mean, I could go on for hours, mm-hmm. but um, just on that note, I think before yeah. we pass over, we talked yeah. about a, a short reading, yeah, a, and I think probably just connected short. to what we just talked about, <laughs> yeah. and also connected to the city we find ourselves in tonight. Y- yeah, because I lived in um, Paris for six months when I was in my late 20s, and I love it here, and I come back at every opportunity. So I, just, I was thinking about many things. I was thinking about what caused people to vote for for what in Brexit, say, in, in the UK, and what fantasies were involved um, about, you know, ideas of Europe. And I, I mentioned how I wasn't an ideal citizen. I wasn't scouring, like, the fisheries sort of laws in my decision to <laughs> want to remain. You know, I wasn't saying, you know, actually weighing everything up um, from a practical point of view. I mean, I have, you know, very good philosophical reasons for rem- for voting remain. But all, I wondered to what extent it was built into certain fantasies about place and Paris as you'll all know is sort of universally known as a as sort of or internationally known as a place of fantasies and daydreams so I just wanted to read this little page out for um, my sort of private fantasy relationship to Paris which is filled with stereotype and cliche um, I lived in Paris for six months of my 20s and the long stretches of newcomers solitude were filled with a dizzying interplay between fantasy and reality. I watched the workers returning home, carrying baguettes with the tops or the elbows already bitten off. The sight of an old woman buying biscuits at the bakery section of a down-at-heel grocery store had a Balzac pathos and dignity. Halves of lemon sunk into crushed ice, omelettes at midnight, a waiter's apron, the ashen melancholy of a big boulevard. All my delights had been felt by others a thousand times before, but they were overtired rather than tired, 
and had that jittery, perverse energy of this stage of exhaustion. I loved passing that most sustainable resource of Parisian life, rows of people sitting outside, fulfilling their contractual obligations to my fantasies, <laughs> drinking small drinks slowly and talking a kilometre a minute, holding up their cigarettes to the evening sun. When I go back to Paris now, there is always a dreamlike quality to the first few hours. One of the last times I visited, our waitress during this transitional phase asked where we were from. Londres, she sighed, pressing the base of a four euro coke into her midriff as she flipped off the cap. I would love to go there. While she gazed into the middle distance and thought of London, I remembered my sooty slalom down the Victoria line, the St. Pancras sushi shop's mindless circuit, the vastness of consumer choice that somehow always funnels itself into a pret-a-manger porridge. <laughs> Her daydreaming cut like acid through mine, and out past the awning, the Rue des Abesses suddenly looked corroded and fragile. The circular faux marble tables all around me began to resemble their ersatz counterparts outside the Café Rouge at Euston Station. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. So if you have a question for Lawrence, raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you so that everybody can hear you. Who would like to kick us off? Don't be shy. Oh, yeah, let's, um, we'll just pass the microphone over. There Thank we go. You. So excited to be first. Um, <laughs> first of all, as a disclaimer, I'm from Silicon Valley, which means we get a new toy every week, and we argue it, and we do all of that, you know? In addition, I raised two kids with this, so <laughs> they've learned who they are through social media and through digital use and all of that. So I'm not going to go there, but I am going to say, let's presume you're a um, utopian hope. Yeah. And given that you have utopian and we can't even, because all of us are afraid of the downturns and, mm. you know, deep fakes and all that. Mm. But presuming that we have a utopian use of all this technology, is the smart refrigerator actually a smart idea for the brain development? So think about mm. that. Is it more important to have uh, the good food in the refrigerator and therefore I eat the good food or as a developing human mm -hmm. is it better that I have to go through the process of deciding what is mm -hmm. good food and whether I grow from mm -hmm. that using that tiny example to, it uh, extrapolates to almost any other example so that when we have like the huge brains and the skinny bodies of science mm -hmm. fiction. When we become that, are we really smarter or are we just going through an uninterrupted life because everything's working for us? Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? I do. It's process versus product kind of thinking. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Should I use this now? Okay. Um, maybe, well, maybe I'll pass it to you. I'll I'll pass it to Thank you. Uh, um, yeah, I don't know if any of you have Gmail, but have you noticed um, in the last little bit, there's now these new um, sort of suggestions for what you should say um, in terms of like the unthought about life. Um, and I think that's, you know, they're pretty dark, that whole idea. And, and uh, you know, you could write this, um, you know, tell the sort of terrible news or sort of, but it could be slightly sensationalized. And, and Gmail might suggest like your reply or someone might email you with this sensational news that's really awful. And, and Gmail will pick up on the sensational qualities of it. And one of your suggested replies might be, wow, or something like that. You know, this awful tragedy. Wow, that's amazing, exclamation mark. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what they're thinking of that. That seems to me the most bleak relationship to language. And if you read sort of George Orwell on um, politics and the English language, he's talking about that, that idea of sort of the IKEA, he didn't say IKEA, but that sort of flat pack sort of... Um, uh, sentences just built sort of to get sent you know paragraphs built from these unthought clauses just junk 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 together so the way in which algorithms do take over i mean going back to the servant spy question of the smart fridge um you know there i mean there's a lot in the in uk culture there's lots of sort of parodies of what the upper class who are sort of served to all the time become you know they become quite useless in many ways um they can't open a can of soup that's sort of the cliche of that you know and i mean i'm not sure i i'd hate to generalize because there's so many applications to these technologies which aren't as farcical as that gmail thing and there's really serious sort of accessibility issues and all sorts that um i can't you know I don't, I don't really want to comment on in general, but I think uh, my writing 
tries to sidestep because it's really difficult to make moral pronouncements and try and just say, well, in the 20th century, we had this relationship to the things in the home and that had a certain set of phenomenological repercussions and, and emotions and the palette of, of a daily experience. And now if the things no longer operate like that because they've been coded to give us these conveniences or advantages, then we'll have a different set of uh, phenomenological experiences. And that's about as much as I can get to because I, I, I really think it's really a danger to sort of dismiss things across the board because some of the advancements are really crucial to people and really life-changing and wonderful. Who's next? Yeah. I'm just, one thing I think about quite often is whether we're talking about in this online world where you can reach out depending on how many followers you have or whether you're on Facebook or Twitter, is are we in a time of the corruption of the private or the expansion of the private? Um, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure that we can. You can even. It's possible mm -hmm. to answer that yet. But yeah. one area in which I often think about this is you see on Twitter, the most private things being expressed. Uh, for example, it's your wife or husband's birthday, or yeah. it's your kid's birthday, yeah. and you say, "Happy birthday to my five-year-old." Mm -hmm. Happy anniversary to my wife or husband on our thirtieth anniversary. Mm -hmm. What is it in the human brain? Mm -hmm. I think that mm -hmm. makes us think that that is actually sharing. Mm -hmm. Because let's say you have 20,000 followers. You know, 19,900 of them have no clue who you are, yeah. really, and you're sharing this private moment yeah. in this public sphere. And I don't know if studies have been done about that or what yeah. it's doing to us over yeah. a long term. It may be too early to decide that. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious if you deal with that at all in your book. For sure, yeah. I think I have a term in the book called the press release emotion, um, which is where... Um, the demands of the form of social media and that kind of sharing produces um, ways in which we have to almost sort of cover our bets and release sort of very down the uh, sort of straight on responses to things. You know, so if, if there's sort of, you know, an atrocity around the world, the various heads of states will, uh, you hope, sort of denounce it. You know, this is an act of cowardice. This is terrible. And that sort of sense of that's what I mean about the press release emotion that all of our sort of private declarations have to take on the tone of sort of Theresa May at the sort of lectern outside number 10 because the audience is of a, potentially of a similar scale. Um, and I think that will change the, w the things we're willing to utter in public. You have to have almost a politician's blandness, perhaps. But what you say about the corruption, is it, is it um, a wonderful thing or a corruption? I mean, I'm not sure that, you know, the our sense, our awareness of police brutality and sort of racial or racism in the States would have been possible to know in the way it's known at the moment without that ability to share the private and to say, this just happened to me, look what happened, you know, and uh, would me too have happened without this form? So um, we have to be careful how we think about it, but I do think there might be um, ways in which it's rewiring the ways our emotions are shaped or produced or uh, changing the gap between sort of hidden thoughts or thinking out loud you know this idea of people i was just thinking out loud but thinking out loud nowadays if you think out loud on twitter it can get you fired so that's new um and the, there's going to be sort of ways in which it's beneficial and progressive and other ways in which it's really restrictive and we're still uh, negotiating those bounds, I'd say. So it's both, which is sort of a hedging my bets sort of answer. But it, it's a corruption of the private and a um, a bringing to light in the public sphere of private things that should be shared widely. I think we've got time for one more question. Yeah, lady. So I think it's more like an observation, mm -hmm. but I feel like that like it's really important about like influ influences mm -hmm. that um, you're sort of like starting to also like dream their dreams and like <laughs> like imagine that oh yeah it should be like like even their like you now Instagram travelers mm -hmm. like or like spots where you travel yeah. because you've seen them on Instagram yeah 
and like it's um i was just like thinking about how it could like shift people's perspective and like eventually like what where they go in life because mm-hmm. you know like there, there's like lots of trends that it's like um getting in people like i don't know like even like diets and stuff mm-hmm. that pe- people become followers of diets because of like social media yeah. and and that it's like really shaping where where people go in like life and and uh what uh how how their personalities um evolve yeah or, like i don't know yeah yeah well like, I, it's funny you, it's funny you mentioned yeah. dreams because i had a dream um shortly after writing this i think i can't remember where in the process it was but i dreamt that it, i dreamt about a little boy at a restaurant and he was sort of me but he was sort of play, you know playing me in the future <laughs> like as though i was eight and in 2023 and he was looking through this menu and he said to his sort of shadowy figure of a parent he said um i can't remember what i like and what i'm paid to like (laughs) that's a great idea for a film if anyone wants to take that on um you could have it um so i think yeah there is a dream quality to that but what i would say about the idea of yeah the influences shaping things i mean what we're seeing in all sorts of ways is a movement towards extremity with influences so youtube a lot of uh, youtube vloggers it's actually quite a deadly pursuit because some of them are dying in in the attempts to create sensationalized content so someone um shot their partner through a book that they thought would stop the book uh, the book would stop it and it was this sort of sensational stunt and it ended up um, killing the partner. Or, yeah, a lot of, yeah, it's quite deadly. There's been, you know, a few, at least a handful of people chasing this sort of intensity. And if we just get a culture where the value system is the most extreme thing is what people pay attention to, then that's really dangerous. Um, it, there was a couple of famous YouTubers who have some online beef and then they transported that to the uh, to the boxing ring. And they're just always looking for more and more extreme ways to sort of announce themselves because we're in a so-called attention economy, which is sort of a gross term. And so our attentions are competing for so many things that people are behaving in insane ways in order to grasp some of that attention. So I think that'll be the thing to think about more than what, the influences where they're making us go on holiday it's what they're sort of um making us do and or what what they think what making us think what is normal behavior for other people which i think is a interesting <laughs> note to leave yeah, it on it's a mantra. <laughs> um we uh we do that is all we've got time for um at least for this sort of conversational part of the evening however do stick around we will be as ever serving wine so you can continue the conversation with lawrence with each other um of course, there are plenty of copies of Picnic Comma Lightning available at the front desk, as well as the four-dimensional human. Um, and Lawrence will be here signing, so please uh, pick up your copies mm. first and then come up here. Mm. And so all that remains for me to say is please join me one more time in thanking Lawrence Scott. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>